Okay, so uh, my name is David Gustafson, Vice President of Engineering, <laughs> and we're going to go into a little bit of what we refer to as active-active mirroring. So this is a configuration architecture where we allow for two ISCs to connect together and share the data path between the two. So you can create a volume in one and can create another volume on the other one, tie them together, and they present the same volume ID to the fabric, meaning the server don't know which one is what, and it doesn't matter. To the server, it looks like more available paths to the same volume. This allows now you to create a storage cluster with high availability and, if you will, if should a device fail or a data center fail, because you can also do this across data centers, you now have a full active-active, active-active. So not only are the two controllers in one architecture active-active for that volume, but so is the other one. And we're doing a, a locking architecture between the two systems that allows them to be fully participants. So the volume can be accessed anywhere. So from the host perspective, it just looks like some paths went away. Same thing as if you would pull a cable. And this simplifies setup uh, tremendously from a high availability perspective. Synchronously mirrored, of is course, there, between the two there, pieces. Is there cache coherent across all four controllers? Yes, they are. In my, what's the, what's the uh, inter-controller interface? Fiber channel. Between so the two systems. Yes, exactly. So we use fiber channel data path redundant fiber channel data path between the two controller to uh, allow for IO forwarding. So you get a write from one guy, he got to IO forward it to the other guy. Once he gets an acknowledgement, he got to go back and say, yes, server, I got it. But he can't say acknowledgement until the other guy went forward. So the IO forwarding has microseconds impact because of the fiber channel delay. But since it hits, it's hitting the cache, the DRAM cache on the other side, it is not a huge impact because it is microseconds, right? So on the other hand, though, if it's a read, you now have twice the amount of spindles opportunity to read from. So if you have a round robin, least queue depth, uh, multipathing settings from the server, you actually increase performance doing a high availability architecture because you now have twice the amount of spindles contributing to that performance set. Make sense? Okay. So yeah, so when I was looking at doing my, my review previously, it sounded a little bit like a tandem or like doing everything in lockstep, but you're not actually full lockstep to both sets of code Correct. Way into the stack we are to. IO lockstep per volume, okay. but we are not code lockstep's in that the instruction sets per controllers are running in lockstep. Yeah. So you yeah. So it flushes across to DRAM cache. Correct. On the other controller and then gets the acknowledgement and that's when you exactly right. Say, right so there's a slight IO forwarding uh, um, delay. Yep. Right. Fiber channel transport mm -hmm. delay. Uh, but what it does for you on the read side is that it. Uh, now distributes those IOs over twice the amount of spindles. So what we see in many cases where it's not a pure write uh, environment is actually a performance increase to uh, when we put this together. The writes are acknowledged at the time that the first controller gets? No, uh, second. So it goes go to a second, come back, and then go back up. So it goes a round trip. second you're talking about within the same, no, the second system. So the, so, so the system here works as a tight coupled cluster, meaning it has acknowledgment. That means both controllers. Can you draw it on the whiteboard? Yes. <laughs> You can erase the problem. Right, that that like, <coughs> like whiteboards. Yeah. We don't like problems. And we've had some requests from Twitter to, Who to draw the I.O. Yeah. path. So. so. Down. One down. <laughs> controller one. No in place sparing. Controller two. <laughs> controller three. Controller four. Server. I.O. comes into controller one. Through path one. He mirrors internally to the DRAM to have it backed up internally. The mirroring functionality inside of this forwards it to controller three. Controller three mirrors it internally, replies back to say ACK, and then it goes back to, so to, to server. The ACK is actually at the fourth mirror. If you will. Yes, so at this point you have now. Four copies of the data. Correct. You have four copies of the data at that point. Okay. okay. What it does for us is uh, it allows us to now, if you will, <coughs> you can talk about it being draconianly safe, if you will, and maybe yes. have an opportunity to uh, not mirror it. The f matter of the fact is the performance impact of that forward I is negligible in almost all cases. So unless you are microsecond uh, sensitive on your rights, uh, this, th the opportunity to take away the second mirror uh, really doesn't buy us a whole lot. So would the cheering be mapped 
the same across all four controllers then? Great question, I love it. Yes, so we actually have internal data uh, sharing me uh, metadata that allows for when a sheet gets upgraded on one controller from a hot sheet perspective, it tells the other controller upgraded too because they see different I.O. patterns and were they left to be independent, one would have an upgrade and one would have not. And now you get disparate media covering the same volume depending on what path you choose to ask for. But now you're wasting that space on your flash, but it's not your primary copy that you're accessing, right? Primary copy. No, no, so uh, what happens is, let's say that we have a uh, flash tear. It's an active, 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 so uh, you can read okay. from all of it. And yeah, you need the whole thing to be consistent. So flash tear and HDD tear. One sheet goes up here, same thing happens over here, such that you have a symmetric representation of the media backend, such that you don't get different I.O. performance based on what path you choose. Across Predictability. all four controllers, the, the tiering map, is, the heat map is effectively the same. For the volumes that they share. So you don't set they these don't controllers. Volumes? You, you, no, you do not need to tie the volumes together. You choose what volumes you want them to share. OK? Do they actually exchange the heat map, or they do, <coughs> do they exchange the? They exchange the decisions to upgrade, not the entire heat map. So then you have an opportunity, when you resync, Which? to exchange. So, so on a continual operation perspective, they just exchange the, uh, what's getting upgraded. Right. Something got hot on one side because yeah, of a, it, a multipathing it's, choice. It's an, it's an interesting choice, because yeah. depending on how the multipath from the host Perks, yeah. is operating, <clears throat> you could, if a, an area of the volume, you know, if you had, if this was a VMFS cluster, mm -hmm. and one host was set for round robin and the other was set for primary secondary, yeah, you, know, you could get weird, recently, you could get weird, whatever, you yeah, could get weird results recently. because <laughs> the data being accessed by the host doing round robin would have the blocks that it's accessing being warm on both of them, but the Maybe, guy who's doing yeah. all <coughs> heavy, who's doing failover would be hitting one source all the time, and Correct. that would look mm -hmm. hotter. Yeah, maybe. Exactly right. Well, depending on the relative, relative heatness of the IO2. Well, yeah, yeah, that's but, but absolutely you know, right. Maybe that distribution the logic is dead on. Keep the relative the heat yeah. down. You know. The logic is dead on. The heat map wouldn't actually so. map the access free. The, the promotion decisions wouldn't actually map what do you guys use? Exactly, those? because the promotion decision is based on the ability for one eyes to carry it. So in the sense where you have a round robin architecture like you're talking about, what you're doing is not distributing that heat across more spindles. Right. And actually, you don't want to migrate those blocks if they're not hot enough to make sense, because now you have s chosen not to use up the SSD quota for the one that hot needs enough, it. Hot enough to make sense is an arguable. Right. Right. Well, it depends on the it, workload. It, de it depends on, on it depends so on what you mean by sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. What do you guys usually use for uh, for a multipath policy? What do you? Round robin. <coughs> Round robin, least queue depth, or so. Naturally, since we have the ability to do active active uh, servicing across all ports, we want to take advantage of it, right? So yeah, reads would be. Well, right, reads and writes. So so what happens is. Uh, um, depending on IO path and where different loads goes, what happens is it's, it's, it's auto balancing when you do that, right? Because it's going to go around. But if you just did a round without least queue depth or, or so, then what happens is uh, you might have one port that gets its uh, unfair share of I.O., even in that sense, because the transaction size has an impact on the service time. So even if it's one I.O. here and one I.O. there, one might be 128K and one might be 2K, and that has a different service time. So that's why least queue depth makes a much, much nicer uh, distribution piece. So let's take it into a little bit of discussing the management interface and uh, what we do to try to make this relevant for the sysadmin, especially the virtualization guys. So we have a management interface package that we refer to as ICE Manager. The idea behind this is to put together a management interface that makes it a lot easier to manage storage. First of all, um, RAID groups and architecting the storage configuration for some systems is incredibly uh, complex in certain areas. We don't do that. What we do is say, you initialize the eyes, and then it says, okay, great, we're done. Now, what size volume do you want? And do you want to RAID 1 or RAID 5? And that's all we really provide. And the reason for it is because 
we distribute the I.O. across all drives, and there are no need, what we have seen, to give those complicated knobs to try to make it better, because it doesn't get much better. And they, uh in the cluster environment, how far can the two systems be apart? 100 kilometers? That so uh, for fi dark fiber, fiber channel connectivity is 40 kilometers. We are wow. qualifying right now an FCIP support that takes it to within five milliseconds round trip. So five milliseconds round trip is what? 200 kilometers, something like that, in, in that neighborhood, right? So uh, what you see here is the login scheme for, and the whole idea here is that it's one 3U system, but you want to have one management interface to manage them all. So this is the collection point where all the units are managed as one system, if you will. So you can see what your uh, service are utilizing. You can go in and take a look at each individual unit, health reporting, uh, capacity utilization, reporting, those type of things, right? We have uh, a question on Twitter. Uh, is, you should have active active for ESX, but right. is that true for all hypervisors or? No, it's not. So it's a qualification thing. So where we see the most need <coughs> and use for the active active architecture right now is VMware clusters. VMware clusters that wants to do an active active architecture on the storage piece and rely on it as if it was an always available volume. And then they do DRS rules on top from a, a, a cluster perspective to manage resource recovery or failover scenarios. So we have focused on VMware for now. We are in the same. We are in the process of qualifying towards Windows as well. We're seeing less and less Windows clusters in that scenario. I anticipate that's going to pick up with some Hyper-V adoption, but uh, right now, the physical Windows machines that we see are purely just databases, so. OK. okay. So what the point of uh, and the power of Ice Manager is to automate and drive simplicity. Automation and hide a lot of complexity that you shouldn't need to, right? So if you look at how we do this is two click uh, virtual machine creation, including volume creation. So if you want to create a new data store, it's not go to the storage, create a volume, go to the VM cluster, rescan the pieces, find the pieces, draw them together and, data, and make it a data store. We integrate with vCenter to provide and automate that entire chain of uh, provisioning commands, such that you can go through a wizard in Ice Manager and it will create a data store for you with a certain size and a certain uh, alignment with a certain RAID type uh, in a couple of clicks. Tremendously powerful for those who don't want to be a storage admin and just need some storage, right? Just go in and click it and make it happen. Uh, we also do quite a bit of what we refer to as uh, best practices ver verification and validation. So this infrastructure, uh, the interface allows you to add vCenter as a managed object inside of our management interface. And it shows now all the virtual machines, all the data stores, and everything inside of it, OK? And uh, should you have a cluster, for instance, that do not have access to where all the nodes in the cluster have access to the same volume, that's a misconfiguration, because now you can't do failover, right? A cluster node can no longer run what you should have run from every single cluster node. We have an automated best practice check to see are all volumes accessible to all nodes? And if it's not, we have a simple fix it button where it goes and does it, which d goes out and takes the volume, presents it to that host, go to the host, rescans it, make sure that it's there, and validate from the host perspective that it's connected to that volume and it's fully visible. So simple little things that are such a huge potential problem, should you have an error scenario and you can't do a failover or so because you don't have the right configuration, it, it really makes a big, big difference. So here you can see some of the uh, interfaces. You can see we have Microsoft ecosystem, VMware ecosystem, Citrix, and Linux. And the whole idea here is to give a server-side management view of how you want to manage your storage such that you can tie in to the server guy who needs to manage this and not have to worry about the storage guy. 